What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment, and please be sure to hit that subscribe button right there. It's free. As you all know, we want to keep bringing you guys as many interviews as possible and getting as many as the icons, legends, and pioneers of the game. So please hit that subscribe button, like the content, share it, promote it, each one, teach one, and we appreciate it. Now today, we have the honor and the privilege of being joined by two icons, giants, pioneers in the game. Easy AD from the Cold Crush Brothers and Said G from the Mighty Ultra Magnetic MCs, among many other things. So thank you both for coming through to Unique Access Entertainment. One, two. Yes, you yes. to be here. A one, yes. two means thank you. <laughs> <laughs> one, two in my era means one, two. We test in the microphone. <laughs> yeah, taking it all the way back. In hip hop, it means thank you. <laughs> Yeah, hip hop was originally always different from society. That is true. So, um, since we do have uh, foundational members <coughs> of the game, hold on, hold on. Let me add, let me add a detail. That's why they try to uh, make a commercialization of what I just said, and uh, somebody tried to patent this difference and called it ebonics. But the problem was, it always changes. So. I mean every word of it. So you can you can't write a ebonics dictionary. So it was stupid. So but they tried to rebrand it. See, it was called hip hop. Then they said we're gonna patent it and own it. So let's call it ebonics. That's business. That's what people do. Like I'll take that Baltimore Ravens shirt you got and I say I want to make it mine. So I'm gonna call it the Baltimore Aven. <laughs> you know, just make something up. That's what that is. So we get the yeah, man, it's a it's an amazing thing. Uh, so Easy AD, uh, start with you musically as one of the you know early on pioneers and everything. One of the early things since I'm a couple of years younger than you guys, I would imagine. Uh, I remember hearing was the uh, that you had that better jump shot than Rick Barry from Wild Style. Um, oh. So of course, at that point, you'd already been rap and performing and everything for me for years and years but uh just with getting to wild style taking a little bit out of order but that moment how did that change how you saw you were perceived and how you perceived yourself and where your career was going well honestly um first of all let's i want to put it in context we didn't and we never saw it as a career number one right so we didn't view it as it was our career, my career. It was that we were doing something. We were doing exactly what we like to do, what we love to do, um, what we felt that we were born to do. So when we start filming the um, uh, Wild Style, it was just we were just being ourselves. We were actually, you know, the Cold Crush Brothers, being ourselves, doing what we were doing in the Bronx uh, in the movie. Um, but that movie helped propel the hip hop culture worldwide. It took uh, hip hop worldwide basically and it gave a um an insight it gave the world an insight on what what was going on in hip-hop basically and, and some of the origins right and since in 82 of course at that point it had been going on for years um the thing that i always think is so amazing because one of my good friends is b love from jbc force and you guys are his favorite group and he taught me a lot about you guys later on because I had heard some of the tapes and I knew some of your routines and I knew Weekend and punk rock rap and all that earlier on the record side of things. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to get in because rap was so big and harmonizing and routines and stuff early on, I wanted to get how and why did that even end up being the way it happened? Well, so when you, when you and the rest of the world heard of Rappers Alike, it actually put hip hop backwards, right? Because we were, our skill level and the way that we rhymed and we did our routines were way ahead of that. So um, we can take a, uh, we would take a popular pop pop song like Cats in the Cradle and the Silver Spoon, the little boy blue and the man on the moon, and then we'll, we'll, we'll throw our hip hop version of it. Like other MCs can't deal with us because we are the phone on As the Gold Crush. So it was a science behind what we did. We took something pop, put the put our put our hip hop lyrics behind it, and put a fat hard beat 
behind it. And it changed the game because uh, everyone was rhyming basically the same way before we started doing those harmonizing and routines. They were going like, Ike and Mikey was playing in a ditch. Ike called Mikey, you dirty, set up clean, nah, nah, you know, so stuff like that. So the Cold Crush four MCs, we didn't want to be like everyone else. We want to, we want to establish our own style, our own flow, and set us set ourselves apart of of the uh, the MCs that were presently at that present time. And we did that. We were considered like the Mike Tyson of hip hop, basically, because we we knock out all comers. We 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 knocked out a lot of people uh, in in the culture, on on the underground tip where like the the masses who buy records don't know about. Like we we battled the Fantastic Five in 1981 at Harlem World. Um, and for, let me give you a visual of that. Harlem World is a, a multi complex uh, entertainment complex, three floors that hold about four, 4,500 people. It was packed to the Raptors, and we were battle for like hip hop supremacy, right? Because the streets determined who was hot and who was not. And um, actually, we lost the battle that night, but we didn't really lose the battle once the tape got out. The tape got out, and they heard the tape, and that was really the end of the Fantastic Five. And I think that the only thing that was the difference they had they had Grand was a theater and we had Charlie Chase. That was the that was the difference really. Right. So for you, said G, listening to and being around and watching these amazing routines early in the game, how did that shape you as a as a writer in particular, as somebody that was then gonna be very distinctive himself? Well, see, both of us grew up in the BX. So A was up at the uh, top end of the block and I was in going down more towards 169th Street. Then you had Scorpio in between both of us from the Furious Five. But uh, like I said, uh, for people who didn't hear our prior interview was that uh, when I was in seventh grade, right? And I was in McCombs 82 at the time. That was the name of the school, but now, you know, they call it something else, but that's on the west side of the Bronx, right on University Avenue. And uh, we had this little program called African American Week in our junior high school. And, uh, you know, the girls were dancing behind percussions and then B-Boy Clark Kent, one of the original hip hop pioneers came out in the Superman costume, cape blazing, but he left his glasses on. Never, you know, he forgot that Clark takes off the glasses to become Superman, but he left them on and he started break dancing. That changed my life. There's two, two moments in hip hop that changed my life. Uh, that was the first. The second was, uh, there was a legendary basketball player, the late, great Pearl Washington, who impacted both of us on the basketball team. So it was my senior year in high school, but uh, because we had a sore high school, other basketball coach, me and my brother, who dropped a dime on us at our new school so that it messed our season up. Uh, I couldn't play my senior year of high school in basketball. So I played on the AAU team. And one of my AAU partners, he went to a high school called Norman Thomas, which at the time in New York was known as it as far as females. It had the best, highest caliber of females. So Norman Thomas was playing boys and girls high school and Pearl Washington had previously played for Norman Thomas and he transferred to boys and girls. So they were playing at boys and girls high school and they had that gym overfilled, you know, and it was kind of like city college, but not as many because of celebrity power. You had a bunch of people outside who wanted to get in, but they couldn't get in. Norman Thomas, like I said, they were known more for their cheerleaders than their basketball team. Even though they had talent on their basketball team, they had, had guys like my boy uh, 
Ron Duncan, who was an all city player, my, uh, my boy, Big Fred. But uh, Norman Thomas had the best cheerleaders. They were the finest and they had routines that no other cheerleaders had. So this was my second impactful moment in hip hop. See, I'm trying to set the background up. So it's packed and you got the, you know, you got Pearl crossing over, doing what he does, crowd going crazy. Norman Thomas, coach calls timeout and the cheerleaders come on the court and that routine AD just mentioned that they did. The Norman Thomas cheerleaders made a routine off of it. Never seen cheerleaders do a hip hop routine and they broke into the da 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 da. I was like, like I was just stunned, like, wow, they're so large. The cheerleaders are taking the, and not, not just the rappers, the cheerleaders are biting and borrowing from my brothers. Wow. I have never seen that. Till today. You know? That's you. got marching bands that do hip hop routines, but the cheerleaders themselves, you know, it, it's crazy. But that's where that comes from. That was the beginning of that. Okay. Norman Thomas High School, greatest cheerleaders in the world, finest cheerleaders in the world. They decided the cold crush is that hot. Well, Easy AD, uh, one thing that's an interesting parallel, at least, was Go Go, because I'm from Maryland. I grew up right outside DC, right in between Baltimore and DC. Uh -huh. And as you guys are well aware, Go Go was doing similar things with a lot of the uh, popular records. And later, of course, with rap, they did the same thing. They would, with well, R&B rap or what have you, appropriate the songs and make them into their own thing. <clears throat> so early on, when you would go to DC or you would, you know, hear tapes or friends, family, whatever from that area did, what role of any did Go-Go have with your guys' early thoughts? Honestly, when we, when we, when we, when we, when we began doing our, our routines, we were, we, we didn't, I didn't hear any Go-Go. Like, like 1977, 1978, 1978, 1979, 1980, we weren't, we weren't, we weren't traveling to Washington DC at that time. So we, I didn't get an opportunity to hear Go-Go. So it didn't have any influence on our routines. It was more of the pop songs, um, like, you know, like Billy Joe 52nd Street, when you go, when you go, dun 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 and like a cartoon like Giganto, Giganto, sort of cold crust. So we didn't have, we weren't like connected uh, to Go-Go at that time. So it didn't have any influence on what we did. Uh, as far as lyrically and routine wise. Okay. Yeah, it was, uh, I was just curious because Go-Go really took off in 79, so I knew it was a little bit later, but I didn't know if uh, it had a little bit later any influence. Yeah, we, we were, we were, remember, we were, we were coming out of the disco era, right? So we were kind of, our brains were kind of being finagled with that disco sound. So we were trying, we were trying to free ourselves from that era. Um, and musically, so we were really getting, we were really, really into the James Brown, funky drummer, um, uh, J uh, Bob James, um, and stuff like that. So we really, like the gamut of music that we listened to is a lot of pop beats, a lot of R&B, the Jacks, you know, the, you know, Jackson 5, but James Brown, uh, Parliament Funkadelic, um, um, Heat Wave, because one of the things I always ask people, because people always say, well, I was at, you know, I, was, I meet people who actually talk to me and no, don't know it's me. And I and I have fun. I was on this train the other day, and this guy was like, "Hey, I had on a mask, um, the Coker's Brothers mask." He's like, "Yo, I, I know those guys. You know them?" And I said, "He said, yeah, man. I know I know Easy AD. I know KG. I know all, you know all the members." And I was like, "Okay, but so it's interesting that they don't know it's me." But it's, so my long winded point is that um, what I was trying to make a point of uh, what what was my point? Oh, that um, we, we, I don't know what I, I don't know what my point was. What, what was wrong. Oh, no, I only paid to go-go. But anyway, I don't, I don't know what point I was trying to make. I was just saying, like, I run into people who always say they know about the culture and have been there. I was talking about Heat Wave, 
always and forever. That's what I was going to say. So at the end of every hip hop party at that time, that was the song they played at the end of the party. Then you knew the party was over. <clears throat> they put on always and forever. You knew the party was over. So I run into a lot of people. I was saying like, they always say, oh, I was at, I, I, I was at the, at the shows, I was at the parties and stuff like that. And I asked them one question. I said, so what was the last song they played? They didn't say Heat Wave, they weren't there, huh? <laughs> well, if they didn't, yeah, they say Heat Wave, right? They weren't there. If they didn't say Always and Forever, you know, because a lot of people now, hip hop wasn't a cool thing to be a part of at the time. A lot of people were like, what are you doing? That stuff is never going to be around long. Um, that you, you, It sounds dumb. It's this, this, and that. And, um, it was just something in our it was something in our DNA that made us do what we do. It was like it was like it was like a calling for us. And we still love it. Like one of the things I always tell people, like, me and Sed is actually the same age. Wow. That's crazy. So I'm a, I'm like I'm like five years younger than my 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 members. So I'm like five or six younger than my my group, you know, my my members. So I was I was blessed and honored to be at the beginning of the culture at a very young age. So one thing we talked about earlier is like a lot of people like to put the, um, the drug factor in in hip hop and stuff like that. I can I can say this: I have never drank beer, drank wine, drank alcohol, smoked a cigarette, sniffed cocaine, smoked marijuana, no drugs in my entire life. And I'm honored to say that. Not to say that I'm better than anyone else. I'm just saying I just made different choices. And what, what, given that that was around a lot at every stage of your career, what made you not want to participate in that? Because I'm not, a, I'm not a follower. Like people like to follow and fit in. I never wanted to be a. I never wanted to fit in. I always wanted to have my own individuality. I wanted to be me. So I didn't want to be influenced. I wanted. I didn't want to be influenced by other people. And drugs, everyone did it. So I said, if everybody's doing that then something is wrong with it. So that's one of the reasons why I never did that. And like, again, people, and someone would say this, well, everyone's doing hip hop. I said, not when we began. Everybody was not doing hip hop. Could I chime in on that? Please. Uh, as he's saying, following, I never did drugs up till the time I saw my brothers, my older brothers put the weed to their lips and mm -hmm. inhale. Cause up to then, everybody will try to pass me it. And I say, not so fast, Harry, back it up. But uh, when I saw my brothers doing it, I was like, wow, this must be okay. So the influence part is very, played a big role in uh, people's participation in drugs. And for people who didn't have brothers and sisters, I guess it was their best friends. So that's how it is. And uh, like A said, a lot of people weren't doing so-called hip hop. They weren't B-boys. They weren't B-girls. The DJs were not playing hip hop. But now, this is why he said this guy came up. Oh, I know all the Cold Crush. He wasn't at Cold Crush parties. He may have heard some cassettes because they was all over the place. But uh, being a B-boy, B-girl was like your own little small cult because it was a lifestyle. Like I said, it wasn't no four elements. It was your whole lifestyle. You know, there were, those were four things involved in it. And, and as uh, once again, my boy Charlie Rock said, uh, graffiti wasn't this prominent part. That was just something people did. Whether you was the so-called B-boy or B-girl, that was just artistic people with pens and spray paint cans. Those are things they did. You know, you can tie it in because you had B-boys, DJs, and somebody who might have tagged, but it wasn't like a element, you know. And this, you know, once again, we're going back to saying commercialization, you have people who have pimped culture you know so they try to make up something like four elements or you know ebonics 
you know, these are called pimp, pimping, big pimping. And this is what became of hip hop. Hip hop became, once everybody saw it was what we knew, hot. And they said, oh, it can be monetized. Then everybody was, oh, I was a hip hop DJ. Oh, I was at all the parties, all the shows. And no, they weren't. It was a selective crowd, and you knew who it was because they dressed a certain way, they walked a certain way, they talked a certain way. And like AD said, people try to equate drugs to it. And like I said, it's like uh, with the graffiti, some people did drugs, some people didn't. But somehow it became this main factor in so-called hip-hop when it was a choice. Well, be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a fifty thousand dollar car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV is just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.